Matlock has gone forward with Stewart to the right, Lineker and Howes to the left. Is Gascoigne going to have a crack? He is, you know. Oh, I say! Brilliant! That is schoolboy's own stuff. Oh, I bet even he can't believe it. Is there anything left from this man to surprise us? That was one of the finest free kicks that this stadium has ever seen. Hello and welcome to episode 65 of Hitting the Bar, the football podcast. I'm Chris Carl. And I'm Jeff Saunders. Well, here we are, another week. More drama, Jeff, but before that, your trivia question. Okay, a, a relevant question this week. Jose Mourinho could become just the fifth manager to win the top flight English title, in other words, the Division 1 title or Premier League title, with two different clubs but who are the current four who have done it fantastic we'll find out at the end of the show before all that lots to get through what a week of football let's start at the beginning of an incredible week and look at some of the scores and what happened during last week's round of games we'll start with Wolverhampton Wanderers who lost at home to Aston Villa Jeff I think we had that down as a draw if Wolves would just start to play in the first half they do extremely well for some reason they always start very 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 slowly in the first halves are are bad they they suffered from having a a player sent off which didn't help them very much and Villa did their they have one game where they're very good and then there'll be another game where they're not so good and another game where they're very good that was a game where they were very good yes two red cards in that game one in the 95th minute for Wolves Moutinho and uh, 10 minutes before that Douglas Luiz for Villa and Villa got the late penalty I want to see Manchester United play Wolves because Wolves only start playing in the second half Man United only start playing when they've gone down so I'd like to see Wolves stop playing in the second half and get a goal and then Man United come at them that would be a good game well actually any, any game that Wolves play is a good game to watch you know the issue for Manchester United of course is they, they can't unlock defences which are set up deep because they don't they don't work on the routines that would enable them to do it they don't have a plan so I'd, I'd take Wolves to win that match anyway oh well let's look at Manchester United next then because there was of course the Manchester Derby Man United against Man City nil nil and from all reports probably both teams were lucky to get nil it was one of the worst games of the season and a lot of people saying one of the worst games in living memory neither side seems to be able to create anything at all yeah it was a rerun of West Germany versus Austria in the World Cup wasn't it and a, a pre-arranged nil nil draw yeah it was a shocking game terrible game entertaining thing about that match was the performance after by uh, M- Mika Richards in the uh, commentary booth along with Roy Keane and Gary Neville where every time Keane and Neville tried to speak about Pogba they just got interrupted by Mika Richards who kept saying oh the Manchester United have got to show him the love they're not showing him the love Um, he's really good he's world class for France because they love him which is crap he's had one good game for France in three years one one single good game for France and as Keane and Neville were trying to say if you have a player who doesn't want to play for you get rid of him Manchester United got rid of Roy Keane, they got rid of Yap Stam, they got rid of Ronaldo, they got rid of Beckham, and they survived. And the same will happen when they get rid of Pogba. They should never have brought him back. It was a disastrous decision, driven only by the money, and the only reason he's playing is the, the commercial money behind him, and the people paying that money want to see him on the pitch. Yes, and all those players you mentioned there who were got rid of for either being too big for their boots or out of sorts with the team, all of them, including Yap Stam, I don't even hesitate to add, are better than Pogba and were not missed. So I don't know why everybody's clamouring to mollycoddle him or to keep him or to praise him. He's not only not as good as his hype, I suppose, or as good as his build to be, but when he plays, Man United seems to play, seem to play worse anyway. So quite clearly, the players aren't that happy with him either. Yes, and uh, as Keane and uh, Neville were trying to say, you when you bring in a big name signing, a big money signing, you want him to change the team. You want him to have the impact on the team. It's not the team should be built around them. He has to make it happen. And Pogba's not prepared to, so he's got to go. Personally, I'm very happy that Manchester United keep Solskjaer and Pogba, and yeah. that for the longer, the better. Yes, it doesn't seem to be doing to me any good either way with the manager or Pogba, but his agent has come out a couple of times this last week, very vocal, saying, number one, Pogba's finished at United, and this, that, and the other, and he wants to go, and he will go. And then coming out with a... Then created a, a, a bit of a fuss, and then he's come out with another statement this week, kind of 
placating United, I suppose, but clearly the agent has never, ever had a very good relationship with United going back quite a way. No, he hasn't. And, uh, and I think the question for Manchester United when Pogba goes is, do they ever deal with, with the Raiola again? Because if I was them, I wouldn't. But the, the thing that people like M- Mika Richards and Pogba's other acolytes and sycophants in the press keep forgetting and forgetting to tell you is that when an agent speaks on your behalf, he is you speaking. That is legally what he is. He is you. You have appointed this person to be the agent of me. Rayola didn't say anything that Pogba was not already thinking and agreeing with. Yeah, because Pogba's come out with all sorts of statements as well. Yes, I mean, the agent is your representative. That is another word for agents. So, you know, they've obviously discussed it and Rayola must have said, listen, Paul, I'm going to say this this week. Back me up or keep quiet. Is this what you want me to say? And he said, yeah, I want out. And then they both come out and sort of rearrange what they've said previously and, and try to stem the stem the flow of the, the tide I suppose but really there's no doubt he's going to go but where would he go I think that's a very good question I can't imagine any of the genuinely big teams being interested in, in him except maybe PSG um, Juventus don't need him and I don't think they want him they made that reasonably plain last season Real Madrid well, why I, c- I cannot think of a sing- single reason why they would need him or want him I, it would have to be PSG I mean there was talk wasn't there of Man United and Juventus doing a swap Dybala and Pogba but really there's only w- well, I was going to say only one winner there and that's Manchester United but also Dybala and Pogba and their agents well yeah I'd, uh, if I was Dybala I'd, I'd not want to go to yeah. Man- Manchester United while, while Solskjaer is there because they're a, they're a joke so I, d- I don't know I, I don't know it would be, Dybala for Pogba would be a fantastic upgrade for Manchester United but when you look at Manchester United's midfield with uh, Fernandes and Van der Beek playing may- maybe you add Dybala to that and it would be superb but Manchester United's forwards are good you know that's that's not the area that they, ne- they need reinforcing it's their defence that's terrible alright well that uh, re- rumbles on the Pogba and the Solskjaer debate should they stay should they go the answer being they should go both of them at Newcastle United 2 West Bromwich Albion 1 I don't suppose we should be surprised at that the way West Brom's season's been going the matches I've seen of of West Brom they've looked quite a decent side going forward they just don't they don't have a cutting edge. And if you can't score when you're on top, you're going to struggle. And West Brom will struggle. I think they'll be relegated. And then the other, well, I suppose the biggest game, apart from, you'd imagine, the Manchester derby was Everton won Chelsea nil. Chelsea have since played again. But little did we know. But uh, um, Ever- on Saturday, but Everton beating Chelsea. They've started to crawl back a bit after their amazing start, Everton. Yeah, the, the problems they had were, were in defence, where they they started leaking goals. And they, they've stopped leaking goals now and they look much better. I think these results for Lampard, in a strange way, are, are quite positive for him. If you look at his history as a manager, going, I know it's not a long one, but every time he's had a setback, he's learned from it and he's come back stronger. And I think these last two results, losing last night at, at Wolves, when they dominated the game, will, in a strange way, help him. And it wasn't the Wolves match wasn't just that they dominated possession, it wasn't sterile possession in their own half. The game was played around the Wolves' penalty area. They just lacked the the final pass, the cutting edge to to make the chances. I think Lampard might actually be quite happy because he's the pressure's off him. He's got the time and the motivation to make the players do better, and he can work the things that he needs. He can work on, and I think he'll come back a better manager for it because every setback he's had, he's he's come back better for it. He's got that history to fall back on. The people at Chelsea know about it. It will be better for them. I just want to answer that because I'm a Tottenham fan, so absolutely no love from me for Chelsea and certainly not for Lampard. But um, respect to him, really, because unlike certain other managers currently, and of course famously in the past, he's got a player, Giroud, who was kind of sidelined, kind of wasn't in his plans very much, but now is the only one scoring for Chelsea. But not once have I heard Lampard come out and say anything controversial about him. He's not ostracised him like Mesut Ozil at, at Arsenal. He's not talked the player down or talked him up. He's been very quiet and reserved and just carried on with his job. And I think and Giroud has also been the same. Uh, credit to Giroud. Big, big player, sidelined, you know, looked like his um, future at Chelsea wasn't great. And Lampard stuck by him or stuck with the plan and involved him when he can. He's kept his counsel and I think there's a lot of maturity in Lampard. Yeah, I, I agree. And the only thing that he said about Giroud when he was pushed was, no, Giroud is a big part of our plans. He's going to have a big role to play this season. I'm very happy with him and what he's doing. And when Giroud got all those goals in the uh, Champions League, he'd, he'd earned a re- 
recall and he got one so every player in the Chelsea squad now knows if you play really well you will get a game and that's what every manager wants now every player is working and pulling in the same direction That's what more could you want yes I'm also delighted that Chelsea have lost two in a row um, but we'll come to that in a little while because I'm a, you know, with a Tottenham uh, situation at the moment it's good when your, your fellow title or top four contenders falter but I don't think there's any panic there at Chelsea I'm sure I, you know, they've got a strong squad and as I say a mature leader there in Lampard as you say I think yeah he might use those two defeats to, to shore up where there have been problems and mistakes and to get his players working a little bit harder however that is not so much the case with Arteta at Arsenal you can imagine my delight having watched uh, my team Tottenham draw with Crystal Palace which we'll talk about in a moment when Arsenal lost at home to Burnley on the podcast last week this time last week we said we couldn't believe Arteta was still in the job would imagine that by the time we'd edited it and released it that possibly Arteta would have been sacked and here we are seven days later another loss for Arsenal and he's still in a job it, it is remarkable isn't it contrast him with with Lampard Lampard has some experience to fall back on he has a lot of experience as a player winning Champions, Champions League winning the Premier League FA Cups etc and he has experience as a manager two two seasons and, and you can see the progression of him as a manager the groundsman at the Wanderers has nothing he has nothing to fall back on no experience whatsoever there is nothing to back up any of the journalist claims about him being a great manager or now we've even got to the stage where the sycophants in the press are now blaming the players I'm so Sorry, but a team wins together and loses together. You don't pick elements out of it and say, oh, he's at fault. And Arteta's sick of fancy in the press are now blaming the players for it. And it, it's it's ridiculous. Guardiola was also asked for his opinion of the groundsman's impact at the Wanderers. And he said, if I was part of the board, I would not have any doubts about his capacity to put Arsenal in the place they deserve to be, which I think every Spurs fan would 100% agree with. Yes, they're, in the, they're almost in the right place. There's a couple of places below would be even better. Arsenal nil, Burnley won. That was a veritable relegation battle six-pointer <laughs> because Burnley also desperately needing the points. Yeah, and as you know, throughout the whole of this season, I've said that I think Burnley will escape from the relegation and uh, places and they will be fine. Their only problem is who's going to score the goals. And thankfully, Aubameyang popped up and helped them out. Yeah, let's talk about that game a little bit. Aubameyang now, you've got a feel for him. Uh, he scored more goals for Burnley at the Emirates than he has for his own team, Arsenal, which is just a one. You know, one goal from uh, not one from open play. Arsenal have got ten goals this season, which is pretty bad in twelve games. Um, one player at Tottenham, Son, has got that many. Also, their disciplinary record under Arteta is not great. Since he took over last December, six red cards in the Premier League alone, double what any other Premier League side have got in that period. Double, and two of those for violent conduct. This week, Jacker. The other week, Pepe. Is the disciplinary problem just because? of frustration because they're not doing as well as they should or is it something the manager hasn't addressed I, th- I think the Pepe one was was more stupidity than anything terribly serious to be quite honest Xhaka was a, a big problem and yes I'd imagine frustration is a big part of it however if you look at all the things that are going wrong at the Wanderers all of them come straight back to the manager it's not good enough to say oh yes we're, we're going to hit 44 balls into the penalty area and hope that by some fluke something falls to one of our forwards and we score and then boast about it afterwards use that as some sort of excuse oh no look we did really well we had 44 crosses there, there was a, a match a few years ago I think it was it was Tottenham I think it was had 81 crosses or, or so, you know, no it's Manchester United wasn't it they had 81 crosses in one match and, and didn't score from them well that, that's because if you make a cross you've got to pick a player out not, ju- not just lump the ball into the, into the mess in the middle where lots of players are every single thing that is wrong with Arsenal, the increased number of goals they've conceded, the far, far fewer number of goals they've scored, the far fewer number of points. Every single thing comes back to the manager. He is not good enough. He's an empty suit, and the sooner they get rid of him, the better. No, the best, the better for Arsenal, not for the rest of us. I mean, it, not only as a Tottenham fan am I loving it; it's providing great content for the podcast. But he did say something. I mean, obviously these things are said in context, and you know you have to take it with a pinch of salt. But he was asked about the red card, and he said, you know, obviously it changes the game, etc., etc., the usual thing. But he also said in his post match interview with BBC Sports I don't know what it is we have to do to score a goal well Mikel if you don't know 
Who is supposed to know? Well, yeah, I mean, he, he showed by his comments that he doesn't know, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. That, that lumping 44 crosses into the penalty area and claiming that as some sort of success tells you exactly why they're not scoring goals. He, he went on. We haven't had any goals from midfield. Um, it's something that has to be addressed. To change the qualities and characteristics of players is very, very difficult. A big team needs players in midfield who score goals. Ah, oh, OK, it's the fault of the midfield then. Not Arteta, not the manager. It's the midfield's fault. Ah, so now we know. I, I was brought up to think that the manager sets the tactics, practices, picks the team to execute them in a match, but apparently not. Apparently that's the midfield. Yes, it's <laughs> playing the blame game game, and uh, certainly not accepting a responsibility yourself is not very uh, mature from a manager. This is Arsenal's worst start. We keep saying it's their worst start, worst start, but obviously that increases every week they keep losing. But it's like 46 years now. They're 15th in the league. They've got 13 points. They've scored a total of 10 goals. They've had two red cards this season in close proximity. And yet there he is still in a job. I mean, we talked about Burnley and Sheffield United. Would they get rid of their manager this is Arsenal who believe themselves to be uh, let's say top six and one of the biggest clubs in the world and all that rubbish and yet they're hanging on to a manager that's had no experience he's been in a job for a year and he's taken them right down to 15th yeah and the guy who was there Emslin Sat, who is a very very well respected general manager sort of player finder around Europe was the one member of the the committee that were trying to find a manager to replace Emery who stated categorically no Arteta has got no background no experience we should not hire him he needs to go and get some experience somewhere so after, after the groundsman was appointed he he was Emsin Sat was fired uh, Arteta's friend Edu was brought in as, as football director his friend so there you go yes and Edu's now saying all those lovely things about what a great manager he is he's taking us in the right direction but he's not I don't, I don't know how you can say that. No, it's a question of fact that he's taking them in exactly the opposite direction than the one they need the, they need and want to go to, and blaming the players for his own his own shortcomings. It, it, it's a mystery to me. The, the biggest mystery, actually, is is why the uh, his sycophants and acolytes in the press continue to put these puff pieces up, making out that he's some sort of great manager. On what basis do you say Arteta is a great manager? He has never managed anybody. He has no experience whatsoever. And he's showing it. He's showing it very, very clearly. Yeah, there are many things that make a great manager or a good manager or a manager who shouldn't be sacked. They lost 2-0 in the North London derby at Tottenham who were top of the league at the time. No great shame in that, no, no no cause for panic. But then in the period between that and then losing at home to Burnley, who are in a relegation battle, in the period between that those two games, some of the things he came out and said would normally and should normally send shockwaves throughout a, a, a football board. And then after saying all those ridiculous things, to lose at home to Burnley, any other board would have pulled the trigger, including Man United, who are hanging on with Solskjaer, but he keeps turning it round and getting the odd result and keeping himself in a job. But Arteta hasn't done anything to make a board feel secure. No, they they seem to rely on this um, this idea of the the heroic former player returning to the club. You know, Solskjaer going back to Manchester United, Lampard going back to to Chelsea. Well, at least those two were heroic former players. Arteta wasn't. When, when was Arteta a, a heroic, successful former player at Arsenal? When when did, when did he win the league with Arsenal? When did he win the Champions League with Arsenal? Was I asleep? Did I miss it? He, He's not a, a former great player. Patrick Vieira is a former great player. Emmanuel Petit is a former great player. Tony Adams is a former great player. Thierry Henry is a former great player. Arteta? Are you having a laugh? I mean, th- they've invented the excuse that, th- that justifies the position. And because there is nothing behind it, and he has no experience behind him to fall back on, it's all going wrong. Well, they deserve everything they get. Yeah, I was going to say it's almost a cult of personality, but personality w- would be a misuse of the word, wouldn't it, in Arteta's case? We may come back to Arsenal, but let's move on to some of the other games of that very afternoon. Uh, Southampton beat Sheffield United 3-0. Southampton, well, everybody's beating Sheffield United, sadly. Uh, one point out of the 12 games, not great. 
But Southampton are very good. Southampton are very good, and they're coached by a very, very good coach, Hasenhuttle, who, if you if you didn't know, go back and look up RB Leipzig's performances under him. He, he took them into the Bundesliga, took them the first season up into the Champions League. He's a very, very good manager. It's, it's not just me saying that, but a certain Sir Alex Ferguson says it as well and, and calls him periodically to say, y- you're doing well, keep it up. They are doing well, and if you wanted to put some money on a bet, put money on Southampton for fifth. Yeah, I think they could very well. I mean, I'm not sure about fifth, but de- definitely they've got to be up there with top six, fifth, yeah. Great manager. As you said, Ferguson, I think you mentioned it on this podcast or on the radio show we do for 93.6 Global Radio here on the Costa del Sol. That you've mentioned that when, a year ago, just over a year ago now, they lost Lost, Southampton lost 9-0 at home 9-0 at home to Leicester Ferguson called him and said look if you're having any doubts you are a good manager these things happen and Hasselhutl himself said well you know that was one of the things that made me stick at the job Ferguson class act I don't think there's any doubt about that always has been always will be uh, but Southampton 3 Sheffield United nil. very very good result for Southampton now Crystal Palace Tottenham you said that Palace are one of those teams that upset the leaders and the top four teams when they're on a bit of a roll Tottenham top of the league League, looking good, only lost once. A couple of draws that they shouldn't possibly have had. One of them with West Ham would be clear at the top if it wasn't for those two. But Crystal Palace won, Tottenham won. I watched the game, wonder goal from Crystal Palace, and their goalkeeper, especially in the last 20 minutes or so, suddenly from, from letting a, a tame shot from Kane creep under his body for Tottenham to go ahead, suddenly became became world class. Levy Ashen, even. Yes, he became Levy Ashen. Tottenham should have won that 3-1. He should never have stopped some of those shots. He just never should have. On another day, we would have come away with a 3-1 victory if it hadn't been for that goalkeeper. But I think a draw was a fair result. And it didn't worry me. I'm not suddenly thinking, oh, it's all you know, all going to go wrong now. We've gone Spursy. I just think it was they frustrated us. I was expecting Bale to play. There was rumours he was going to go on and uh, start the game. I think that would have been a great game for him, actually. But turns out he's got the flu. And Mourinho pointed out, said, before anybody says anything, no, it's not this COVID-19. He's got an actual flu. <laughs> well done, Jose. Yeah, and, and well done, Roy Hodgson. I said con- contrast Lampard with, with the groundsman. Well, contrast Hodgson with the groundsman. Hodgson is not known to be a tactical genius. He certainly doesn't do any of the things that the modern managers do in terms of transition from from defence to attack and routines for the the forwards to play and to run at and setting traps for the defence when you're pressing. He doesn't do any of that. He just sets his team up to be incredibly difficult to beat. He knows how to do that and he does it. Jose Mourinho knew that's what he was going to face when he went there. And the flip side of the coin at Crystal Palace is that there is Wilfred Zaha and the new lad Eze who are very, very dangerous on the break. So Mourinho said, OK, we're going to make sure we're not going to be beaten by these guys on the break and the the way he set the team up it worked very well they created enough chances to have won the game but Palace set out to do something they did it very well they succeeded so you have to say well fair play to you and acknowledge that Hodgson whilst not a tactical genius doesn't know what he's doing he has all that experience to fall back on yes I think that's that's a fair summary because you know Tottenham didn't suddenly start playing badly or have a frustrating, difficult day at the office, possibly. But I think that was down to Crystal Palace setting up right. Yeah, and it, you know, it, there is there is no obligation on Crystal Palace to make it a pretty football match to watch. They're there to first of all not lose, and secondly to win if they can. Yes, absolutely. And I think Tottenham probably, yeah, you know, probably deserved that draw. Certainly didn't deserve to lose. But then Palace probably didn't either. But if it hadn't been for that goalkeeper, we would have, uh, let's say, snatched a victory from them. Maybe Maybe not deserved it over the 90 minutes, but no worries for me with Tottenham about that particularly. Just a quick word about Roy Hodgson. I think, yeah, he's underestimated. He probably punching way above his weight at Liverpool and it didn't work out. He is at the right level. He is a manager of a Crystal Palace and all the other teams he's managed. But let's not remember, he has managed teams all over the world and he speaks five languages. This is not this is not some idiot that the press take the mickey out of. This is a very, very clever, intelligent and experienced manager. The only thing for me is that he does stand for me as a blazing indictment of Tory Britain, a man of 74 still having to work. Dreadful. 
many many years ago when I was I was training as an accountant we had a we had a client in East Finchley who make ceramic tiles tiles floor tiles and wall tiles and they were called Ramus tiles and Ramus in in reverse is Samor which is the name of the family and I was talking to the managing director one day who was about 63 64 years old and he was telling me that he wanted to retire and I said well you know you've got a profitable business here you can sell it to someone and retire he said no I can't he said the business was started by my father and I, I took over and said, and unfortunately, my dad is still working on the production line, making the tiles. His father was, his father was 90 years old, and he didn't want to retire, so his son couldn't either. Yeah, a bit, bit weird retiring before your dad. Can't, it's, in his, it's in Roy Hodgson's blood in much the same way that tile dust was in those guys' blood, I suppose. And you just can't, you can't drop it, you can't let it lie. But Roy Hodgson, yeah, that's about the right level for him, and I mean that in the best possible way and well done well done Crystal Palace 1 Tottenham 1 Fulham 1 Liverpool 1 was the much more shocking result Tottenham are title contenders but probably Liverpool are the ones who are going to win it Tur- certainly Tottenham are top 4 contenders where on a day that we maybe drop points Liverpool drop points to somebody they really somebody they really shouldn't have yeah it started off very very well for Liverpool but Fulham were, were very very surprising um, they, they played extremely well they looked a genuine side and I must admit I, I was not not expecting to see that at all. There is an issue at Liverpool, and the issue is, and Liverpool fans will hate this, but the issue is Mohamed Salah. He's not scoring goals, and you could put up with his selfishness in his general play while he's scoring 30 goals for you, but when he's not scoring those goals for you, then that selfishness ends up costing them, and it did in this match many, many times where he could have played Firmino through or uh, Mane through and didn't. Now, he's, he's been doing that for the last three years. This is nothing new. Everyone at Liverpool knows about it, but in this match against Fulham, it cost them the win, and it's been, it's been there all the time. You can see it all the time you know the only way you get away with that as a player is if you score the goals and he's not yes I I mean after having watched uh, Crystal Palace against Tottenham I stayed in the bar to watch that Liverpool game obviously you can only watch so much of it because the bars all close at six o'clock here (laughs) but uh, I watched the first half of that game and I turned to Kirko I sat with and I said are you sure this is Fulham because they went at Liverpool and they played some very attractive and very accurate passing and fast flowing football and it didn't look like the Fulham that you would imagine based on results and Liverpool were pegged back for large parts of that game just imagine how good the Arsenal would be if they had Scott Barker as manager yes just to finish off with that one uh, Jurgen Klopp said that uh, when asked about Fulham playing such great football he said well they're a very good looking team just like their manager which I think a little bit unfair not only is he good looking but we've said he'd he'd struggle in the Premier League but he did very well in that game and uh, points definitely dropped by Liverpool points gained by Leicester Leicester 3 Brighton 0 well there's there's not much to say about that I I think a lot of us had that that result down beforehand Leicester City were a very very good very good team where they can get all their players on the pitch they got I think 9 out of their starting 11 on the pitch so they look very good they're always going to score goals the the players that they've missed have been uh, holding midfield fielders and defenders which has meant they've conceded goals uh, last week it didn't happen I don't think it's a great surprise Brighton play very good football but they can't score and uh, if you can't score you're not going to get points are you no but uh, thankfully for Brighton they have got pl- uh, teams below them that are doing a lot worse although West Brom and Fulham picked up points and then we come to what was very interesting last night two very interesting results talking of the bottom but also out towards the top Chelsea having lost that game to Everton at home were away at Wolves who you said great in the second half well <laughs> they proved you right in this game Wolves 2 Chelsea 1 but uh, Wolves only taking that lead and uh, finishing off winners in 5 minutes of added on time I think Chelsea were very unlucky to lose the match but as I said before I, I don't think Lampard is going to mind that much it gives him a lot of things to work on which the players can see they can see the results of what they were doing so they'll buy into whatever it is that he introduces to put it right and, and history tells us that he will put it right because that's what he's always done and I think takes pressure off Chelsea the last thing Chelsea need at the moment is to is to be top of the top of the league with all that pressure and um, they're much better off chasing and I think they'll be fine they'll, they'll finish third and Wolves just think what they could do if they actually played in the first half it's it's a mystery to me why they, it, it seems to be a conscious thing is that they do genuinely push the players further forward in the second half than the first half and it, it's it's a strange thing to me if they play the whole match they'd win more surely <laughs>
<laughs> yes, you've got a bit of work for the 90 minutes, so you might as well put a shift in. Uh, the other game last night was Manchester City 1. Sounds like it's going to plan. West Brom 1. I'll repeat, West Brom's problem is going to be scoring goals, but if the opposition centre-back does it for you, then you don't need to, do you? Yeah. C- City's problem is Jesus. If City have Aguero on the pitch and can keep him fit for the rest of the season, they'll finish second. If they don't, well, who knows? Because it's not just the goals that Aguero scores that they miss, it's the runs that he makes and the the problems he causes defensive defences, sorry. And Jesus just doesn't. He's he's a completely selfish six yard area poacher, which you can live with. I mean Bayern Munich did extremely well with Gert Muller in that position. Brazil won the World Cup with Romario. If you're set up for that and if that player does actually score the goals, that's fine. But Jesus doesn't. You know, I I don't think I've seen a, a striker miss as many as him for a very, very long time. So when he does finally get the ball, he does nothing with it. And I think Guardiola must be tearing what's left of his hair out. Yeah, and Jesus doesn't cope with crosses very well. Yeah, it's it's not working with Jesus. So um, what, what Guardiola's done in the past when he's had a problem with the centre forward is quite simply not play one. So if if I was him, I'd I'd put Foden in the side, drop drop Jesus and just have players coming from wide crisscrossing in the penalty area, defenders not knowing who to mark because they don't have a centre forward to mark, and create confusion and hope that, that creates something. It's, it's very sad to see De Bruyne receiving a ball in the inside left position, looking up and there's no run on at all. Nobody creating any space. And Foden does that extremely well. So have a, have a front that includes Mares, Foden, Sterling, De Bruyne. It would be yeah, be entertaining and, and could actually work. But having Jesus up front doesn't work. And before we move on to our predictions for next week, or this tonight and the coming weekend, last Friday... West Ham got a 2-1 away result at Leeds. Yeah, a very, a very good result. I mean, nobody knows what you're going to get from Leeds. You, they could win 5-0, lose 5-0, or, or any score in between. And their weakness against set pieces and headers was, was shown up. Susek and Ogbonna getting two very, very good-headed goals. They were quite brilliant, both of them. And that is a weakness for Leeds. It was a weakness in that match because their the centre-back they brought from Germany in the, the close season, Koch, wasn't playing. He's been the rock in the centre their defence and without him they look a bit weak but it was a very very good result for West Ham yeah temporarily at least West Ham were back up to fifth again and looking good especially with some of the other teams not do- like Arsenal not doing as well as expected yeah but I only like to talk about the competition to West Ham so yeah. can, can you keep your Arsenal comments for, for people interested like Fulham and West Brom fans yeah, yeah we, don't, we, don't, we don't mix West Ham of course not with the mid-table and relegation teams of course not uh, so that was West Ham getting a credible 2-1 win away at Leeds tonight as we enter the next round of games by the time you listen to this probably all these games will be done and dusted but it does bear mentioning Tottenham league leaders currently on goal difference to Liverpool are away at Liverpool and I see nothing but a Liverpool victory Tottenham did falter a bit against Palace and did look a little bit out of sorts for me they've only lost once this season in 12 but I think we'll lose at Liverpool I don't know it, it, it all depends on this Salah factor which I mentioned earlier on Mourinho will definitely park the bus and and be incredibly incredibly difficult to beat and then you'll have Son and Kane on the break so can they do something against Liverpool's defence which to be fair has actually looked very good even despite losing Van Dijk and uh, another central defender whose name I've forgotten I, I think a draw is a more likely result than a win for either team to be honest I'd take a draw I think away at Liverpool definitely there's a, a few other games tonight but since it's just a few hours away from recording we're going to move on to what's going to be happening this weekend Crystal Palace hosts Liverpool so they've got two top two teams in a row they drew with Tottenham what's going to happen I, I, think, that, I think Palace will lose to Liverpool yeah, I agree. I think Liverpool will have too much for them. Southampton, Manchester City, on paper, that's a very exciting game. I would hope for and expect a draw, I think. I'm tempted to say 3-3 draw, but will City score three goals? No, I'd say 2-1 win to Southampton. Everton against the Wanderers. Oh, well, Everton should win that, shouldn't they? They're a much stronger team. Stronger in, in every respect, actually. Physically stronger. They work harder. They run further. They're more talented. 
Two, two, one. Uh, during the week, Arsenal uh, tonight are going to be playing Southampton. If they lose that by Saturday when they play Everton, maybe Arteta will finally be gone. Certainly, if they lose tonight against Southampton, they'll be under the cosh at Everton. I think Everton, yeah, should win that. They've started to win again. And if Arsenal do badly tonight, then I think Everton will have a, have a big chance there. Newcastle United against Fulham. Well, if Fulham play like they did against Liverpool, they'll beat Newcastle, but I don't think they will. Yeah, you're right. If they, if they play as well as they did last week, Week, then it should be 2-0 to Fulham. Uh, I'll say they will play that well and, and it will be 2-0 to Fulham. On Sunday, Brighton against Sheffield. Could be quite a desperate game. Yeah, the tr- two teams playing each other who can't score. Um, Brighton are playing very, very good football but can't score. But I'll pick them to win 1-0. 1-0 to Brighton. Uh, and then Tottenham play Leicester. We've had Chelsea, we've had Man City, we've had Arsenal, Liverpool tonight and next up Leicester. Uh, the tough games keep on coming uh, but Tottenham against Leicester... Again, depending on how they do tonight, I suppose. I don't know, but I think 2-1 to Tottenham. But it is one of these matches where you've got two, two counter-attacking teams who both, they'll stay in their penalty area and kick the ball the length of the pitch to the other, <laughs> say, say, no, you have it. No, 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 you have it. Go on. No. Um, 2-1 to Leicester. And then the um, lot from Old Trafford against Leeds United. Okay, just on the basis that Leeds, Leeds will come good at some point, Manchester United will score because their forwards are, are, are that good. Leeds to win 2-1 away. Interesting, yeah. Man United against Leeds on Sunday. I think a draw for me. And then West Bromwich Albion against Aston Villa. Bit of a derby there. West Brom, it's in the papers today that possibly after tonight um, they might sack their manager, Slavan Bilic. So wh- who knows what will happen this time on Saturday. Through the magic of audio, um, you'll be able to listen to this in the future and you'll know. Uh, West Brom, our... Against Villa, I think nothing more than a draw in that for West Brom, and nothing less than a draw for Villa. Yeah, I think uh, a, v- a Villa win 2 0. Uh, and then two more games in this round Burnley against Wolves. Wolves should win that, but Burnley might have the bit between the teeth a bit, having won their last game. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think a draw there, <laughs> one one draw, and the final match uh, Chelsea against West Ham. Oh, that yeah, that's got a draw written all over it, hasn't it? I think yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll go two two draw, and I'm going to go uh, two nil to Chelsea. Sorry, Jeff. Well, that's almost all we've got time for. Time for the answer to your very interesting trivia question. Okay, the question was, Jose Mourinho could become just the fifth manager to win the top flight English title. So that means either Division 1, as it then was, or the Premier League, but with two different clubs. Who are the current four who have done it? Now, three of them, I think, are are fairly obvious to most football fans. Kenny Dalglish, who did it with Liverpool and Blackburn. Brian Clough, who did it with Derby and Nottingham. Herbert Chapman, who did it with Huddersfield and Arsenal. And the fourth, who most people won't know, is a manager called Tom Watson, who did it with Sunderland and Liverpool. Now, at Sunderland, he won the the league in 1891-2, 1892-3. It was a dismal failure in 1893-4. He only came runner-up. And in 1894-5, he won it again. So three years out of four, he won it. The great thing about him, though is not winning the, the the first division, which, you know, one manager does every season. Yeah. But he, he became the first manager to win the World Championship. It's the World Championship for clubs. And this match is the World Championship. It was held between the winners of the English League and the Scottish League. <laughs> <laughs> so... So Sunderland beat Hearts in the final of the World Championship in 1894-95. He then went on to Liverpool between 1896 and 1915, and I think he was the longest-serving manager for Liverpool. And he won the first division in 1900-01, which is the first year Tottenham won the FA Cup, by the way, Um, 1905-1906. He then won FA Cup and all, all sorts of things with Liverpool, including the original of the Charity Shield called the Sheriff of London Charity Shield, which he won in... 1906-7. So the answers are Tom Watson, Brian Clough, Kenny Dalgleish and Herbert Chapman. Brilliant. I love the little story there about the World Championship. How very untypical of the British to, to not look, exhibit their usual modesty and imagine that the world revolves around Britain. What a surprise. Yeah, it's like American baseball teams winning yeah. the World Series. You know. Fair play to you. You win a World Championship every year. Whoa. <laughs> Fantastic. That's all we've got time for. We'll be back next week. I'm Chris Carl. And I'm Jeff Saunders. And that was Hitting the Bar, the football podcast. <laughs>